All right, let's go ahead and get started for today's webinar. My name is Armand Petrosian, and I'll be today's moderator and speaker. But first, I'd like to welcome Dr. Barry Devlin. <coughs> Barry is a founder of the data warehousing industry, defining its first architecture in 1985, a foremost authority on business intelligence, big data, and beyond. He is respected worldwide as a visionary and thought leader in the evolving industry. Barry has authored two groundbreaking books, The Classic Data Warehouse, From Architecture to Implementation, and Business Unintelligence, Insight and Innovation Beyond Analytics and Big Data. Barry has over 30 years of experience in the IT industry, previously with IBM as a consultant, manager, and distinguished engineer. As founder and principal of Ninesight in 2008, Barry provides a strategic consulting and thought leadership to buyers and vendors of BI and big data solutions. He is an associate editor of TDWI's Journal of Business Intelligence and a regular keynote speaker, teacher, and writer on all aspects of information creation and use. Barry operates worldwide from beautiful Cape Town, South Africa, and we certainly want to thank you, Barry, for being here, and I'll now pass it off to you so we can begin the presentation. Thanks, Armand. Yes, sir. It is, it is a real pleasure to be here. Um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to you wherever you are. Uh, as Armand has said, I am broadcasting here from beautiful Cape Town where the sun has just set in a blaze of cerise. Um, so that's all the uh, artistic license you're going to get for this evening. Um, but I'd also like to say, uh, I suppose it's good night to anybody who is listening in from New Zealand, from the original home of Wearscape. I've worked for the folks in Wearscape for a long time now, and it's always a pleasure to do so. So uh, the topic of, of this webinar that I'm going to, to start us off with and maybe take 20 or 25 minutes perhaps talking about is about turning the data vault methodology into a practical reality. And uh, I think that's a really important thing to be doing. The data vault methodology is something that's really interesting and well, relatively new in the world of data warehousing. I've been around in data warehousing far too long, and so anything that has happened within the last 10 or 12 years is new. But um, the uh, data vault methodology, I think, is a very useful way of looking at data warehouses. And we're going to start off talking about why that might be. So first, let me show you a picture of the data architecture since the mid-1980s. So this is a picture, the, the small inset picture in the background, sort of brownie color, is one that I drew back in probably 1986 or 87, so let's call it 30 years ago. Um, it is a the first architecture picture of a data warehouse that I know of, um, and I'm not expecting you to be able to see it. Um, if you do really want to go and explore it, uh, the paper from the systems journal paper from which it comes is available on my website at uh, uh, ninesite.com. But I want to talk about the bigger picture, um, the, the uh, picture that shows the, the uh, funnel in and funnel out architecture of the data warehouse, the two layers within the data warehouse and the separate layer that is the operational systems. So I always talk about this as we have operational systems that are the data that is used to run the business. They're created by the processes of the business and they're all about recording what goes on within the business. And I think that's the way it's always been and in many ways it's going to continue to be that way. The data warehouse itself after an initial attempt to build it as a single layer, very quickly became a two-layer architecture. So we had an enterprise data warehouse and data marts. The enterprise data warehouse, which is probably what a lot of people think about when they talk about data warehouse, the enterprise data warehouse was actually uh, there for a very specific purpose, and that was to get reconciled and consistent data from the variety of very diverse operational systems from which it came. So its purpose is one of consistency, it's one of reconciliation, it's one of data governance. And the data marts, the top layer, 
that's where the users would go for what they need. And this structure originally uh, evolved because our relational databases of the time were not capable of doing both uh, processes within the same database um, at a, at a, in a reasonable time frame. So what that meant was that we had this rather complex architecture which evolved in order to allow us to do that. And creating a good and perfect data warehouse therefore had some challenges. And as we evolve through the, the 90s and the noughties and into the current day, I, what I would think I would say is that there are a couple of key challenge areas that, that data warehousing in general needs to address. The first is that business today needs speed, both in terms of initial delivery, in terms of ongoing change, and although I don't say it here, actually in terms of usage of the data. So thinking first of all about the initial delivery, you know, who wants to sit around for six months waiting for the first delivery of an enterprise data warehouse? Nobody does. Uh, but that's not the biggest problem that, that business users have because they always keep changing their minds. And when they change their minds, that means we have to change the data warehouse um, and maintain it and keep it going over time. And again, it's not even a question of doing this within a, within a, a week or two. It's a question of doing this uh, m very quickly indeed, hopefully within a matter of days or, or a week or so, or indeed right in front of the business user as they sit there. So the need for speed has become so important. The second area is this idea of balancing off governance versus agility. Now, I think in all areas of life we can say this. Um, agility, the need for speed, the ability to change quickly, those things are great and they're, they're easy to do as long as you don't have to make sure that everything is absolutely correct. On the other hand, if you want to do everything right on, on the, by the rules and by the button, then agility becomes harder. So there's always this trade-off that we've tried to make between governance and agility. And that has been the dilemma that IT has had, even when we would say, well, governance is supposed to be the responsibility of the business. So governance versus agility is something that we've really had to deal with. And then we just, as I put in as a note here in a way to remind myself, to remind you, it's not a project that we're talking about, it's a process. It's an ongoing process from the initial thinking about a data warehouse right through to the individual projects that deliver individual specific pieces of function, pieces of uh, satisfaction, if you like, to the, to the business folks. So what are the solutions? Well, as we start thinking about that, one of the solutions is that we really have to find a way of improving the agility and maintainability of this model that is at the heart of the enterprise data warehouse. The old data warehouse approach right back in the mid 80s was a sort of a normalized model. I called it loosely normalized because it wasn't your strict three uh, third normal form type of model, but it was based loosely on that. And it has long been recognized that it's, that's a difficult, uh, a difficult um, model to maintain over time. The alternative model, the so-called Kimball model, um, which is a star schema based model, also has its challenges. And I would also maintain that in a way it's not a generic enough model for an enterprise data warehouse. Well, back in the early 2000s, um, Dan Lindstedt came up with this idea of a data vault. It's a different type of data model, and I'll talk a little bit about it in a moment. The second thing is that we have to figure out how to improve and automate the design, the build, and the maintenance of all of this environment. And I've <clears throat> particularly boxed out the, um, the arrows that are the data being moved in and out of the enterprise data warehouse. But I should also just clarify that it also means the design and the build of the actual data warehouse itself. So although we often focus very much on the process of getting data in and out of a warehouse, 
that process and the way that it's structured is very much dependent on the, how the actual enterprise data warehouse is modeled and designed itself. Now, data warehouse automation is the is the set of tools, is the the class of tools that we talk about these days as the um, most appropriate way for automating the population in and out of data warehouses, as it sort of says on the tin. So, data warehouse automation is, if you like, the second area of solution. So, let's step back just a little bit and have a look at the data vault. So the data vault now at a version two solution is um, is something that I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on because I, I I don't want to 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 waste your time today talking about deep modeling things. But essentially, this is a hybrid um, model. It's a hybrid of the normalized and star schema models that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> excuse me, that has been engineered for agility and for governance. So back in the early 2000s when Dan started talking about this particular model, he was really trying to create a model that said, I know how to make sure that the data within the warehouse is well governed, well maintained, I can trace its um, changes right through from, from the sources through to the targets, I want to maintain auditability, I want to make sure I can engineer it, and so on. And the model consists of, of three different types of entities or tables, hubs, links, and satellites. And each of those types of tables or entity has a particular role within, within the model. So the hubs are essentially where we put these uh, very slowly changing or very fundamental um, elements of the business like customer, like product, and so on. So this is the, if you like, the hub or the right at the heart of, of the structure of the warehouse. The links are basically representing links between hubs, so customer is related to product through a link. That might be a, a transaction or it might, might be a, an order or whatever it would be. So this I, a, idea that the hubs are linked together through these special link tables. And finally, the satellite is where we basically keep all the detail, all of the detail that may be changing, all of the detail that describes hubs or indeed links, so that it is in a separate place and can be maintained separately. And the real value of this structure is that it can be built in stages. You don't have to start with the entire model right up front. You can begin with a piece of the of the enterprise model and then you can more easily expand it to what you need to do. So this is the, the, the data vault uh, model and in version 2 that was expanded with some new technology but also it introduced a methodology for implementation, a template driven methodology for implementation which becomes very, very interesting when you start talking about automation because data warehouse automation as we talk about it really it requires some level of templates. So that's the background. That's the, the where we're coming from. Let's have a little chat about these, um, these different challenges and solutions. I'm going to talk about six of them under three topics. I'm going to talk about breaking into a data vault. I'm going to talk about locking in a data vault. And I'm going to talk about living in a data vault. And let's just see how, the, how we play that game. So my first thought is, if I want to break into a data vault, the very first steps that I need to think about is how do I get the business on board? Now there's an old, old uh, set of thoughts around the business IT gap or the business IT rift. And we've, this is not specific to the data vault, it's not even specific to data warehousing, it is old. It is about the fact that the business thinks about actions, it thinks about results, it thinks about innovation. On the other hand, IT tends to think about structure, consistency, and quality. 
So there's this idea that we've got two different views of the world. On the one side, if you like, we've got the engineers from Mars, and on the other side, the business people from Venus. And in a way, when we think about this in terms of the data vault uh, model and methodology, we're very much looking at this from an engineer's point of view. So data vault to model and methodology is an engineer's view of the world. How do we bridge from the engineer's view to the business view? And hey, if that's the sort of bridge you're going to build between two planets, I'm not crossing it. But we do need to cross the chasm. And that chasm crossing is about extensive collaboration between the business and the IT folks. Really having those two sets of people working together in joint design and development in an integrated environment. That's really important to all types and all uh, classes of data warehouse automation software. The ability to get Mars and Venus working together. It's just as tough as relationships, eh? Um, and getting the business folks and the IT folks working together is where we want to go. So that's the first, uh, the first thing we want to do. We want to uh, cross that uh, business IT rift. The second point, which is also about breaking into the data vault, is, is also a sort of a, let me call it a thinking uh, possibility. It's, it's really about changing mindsets. So when we start talking about data vault as IT folks, we're probably going to start thinking about some principles because IT people like principles. And I've sort of phrased this here saying these principles are a little bit perilous. These are the sort of principles that maybe it doesn't make sense to really talk to your IT, to your business people about. So I want to talk to you, uh, Mr. Finance uh, Manager, about clean separation of ingestion and consumption. And you can see her, uh, or his, in this case, his uh, eyes glazing over. I want to talk to you about auditability, and I want you to not think about Clinton. Okay, so we have these principles that we really want to ingest and involve in the data vault, but we really have to figure out how to make them amenable and digestible to the business folks. And when we, when we do that, what we really need to do is, is we have to put the principles first and begin to start talking to people about the, uh, uh, the um, implications from a business point of view. One of the things that we often talk about in a data warehouse and often encounter in a data warehouse is, for example, the idea that the data that we're getting from our operational systems is not actually um, perfect. And for many years we have tried to say, um, well, you know, in the interest of getting things done, we will do a little bit of cleansing and a little bit of fixing as the data comes through the data warehouse. But actually, if we really want to address the idea of auditability and traceability right through from source to target, we're probably going to have to talk to the business about fixing problems at source. And that's always a very difficult, very, very difficult um, conversation because it costs money. Um, on the other hand, we also need to really if we can't get that done, we have to go and, and have a workaround. And if we have workarounds, and indeed in general, we really need to get into this idea of fully automated discovery, quality profiling, and design. And following through on the collaboration thought of the last slide, this rapid iteration between business and IT in terms of getting things done. So we need to change mindsets in order to break into a data vault. The next area we're going to talk about is locking in the data vault, getting it working, getting it really opened up and, and ongoing. And here we need to recognize that some of the technology that we're talking about here is novel. So as we're talking about locking in the data vault here, um, we're really going to be talking about uh, IT stuff. This is things that our developers really need to, to, to think about and to incorporate in their, in their way of being, in their way of working. 
So for example, um, this idea of referential integrity. Referential integrity is something that most database designers tend to want to build into their databases. Hey, but a data vault doesn't have referential integrity by design. And that's about uh, helping in terms of the agility of to change. We have a proliferation of tables in the data vault design, the hubs, the links, and the satellites. Um, in this case, we have many types of tables, and there are more than those three that I've just mentioned, based on rates of change, business categories, and all those sort of things. This is a quite a, a complex uh, type of environment with many specific ways of uh, doing things, including, for example, updating these tables by deltas, which may be something that, if you've been around the data warehouse for a long time, may be something that you you don't normally do. So all of this is new technology for our developers and we really need to, to make it easier for them. And one of the key ways of making it easier for them is to really help them to master the environment with technology, with automation. So auto-generation of the correct structures, the correct processing logic, the hash keys, the change keys, all of those things, if we can automate that rather than having the developers have to do it themselves, this really makes life so much easier. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the methodologies that have been have come out with uh, Data Vault version 2, and indeed they do date back somewhat to the earlier versions of Data Vault, give us these best practice templates that we can use and incorporate into the uh, data warehouse automation tool itself. That allows us to eliminate human error. That helps us to get things move faster. That helps us to get more quickly from the design to the build phases and from the build phases through to maintenance. All of these things, very useful in terms of dealing with novel technology in the, in the data vault. And as we then go through this uh, data vault, we need to tie it down and make sure that the methodology is enforced. For example, we, we know about the, the problems of development and we've encountered them before. I mean, we have a key developer, he gets run over by a tram. What do we do? Well, we have to, we have to figure out how to handle it. Automation of the date of the data vault build of the data vault design um, in a methodology helps us to meet those needs. Um, we want to in, we want to encourage developers not to be reinventing the wheel. We want them to use standards to use the the the, the correct way of designing and building the various components of the data vault. And this again comes down to using uh, the data warehouse automation software to enforce consistency and best practices. This gets us a team that's aligned. It gets us the same look and feel in terms of all of the code, in terms of all of the designs, which makes for easier maintenance in the, in the uh, follow-on phases of the, of, the, uh, data war of the data vault, but also allows us to really onboard easily uh, new, new talent. And at the heart of this is a metadata repository. Moving on reasonably quickly, because I see the clock ticking by, let's talk about living in a data vault. Uh, we need to have the idea of dealing with these ongoing operational predicaments. And excuse my strange sense of humor that I've put in some medieval operations here. There are really much more uh, gruesome pictures that I could have used. But operations overhead grows as our complexity increases. And in that case, manual approaches fail very quickly. So in order to make sure that we've got ongoing maintenance, ongoing operation, ongoing, um, you know, just keeping everything going quickly and, and efficiency, efficiently, automated operations are key. And indeed, data warehouse automation, automatically, there's three automations in the same sentence, handles execution, dependencies, failure processing, integrated scheduling, and logging, and all of the things that you, that you could need. Which gives us, which leads us finally, I think, to our last, our sixth um, item, which is 
the idea that in this world today we need to continue to handle non-stop high-speed business change. Business folks are always looking for the next greatest thing. They're ne trying to solve the last problem in the fastest possible way. This high-speed change always impacts our data vaults, our data warehouses. And this business-driven change impacts our technology folks, our IT. Um, we need to be able to do effective and quick impact analysis. And that means having useful and current documentation. And I'm not going to remind you how difficult it is to ensure that we have useful and current documentation if it's done manually. So if we've got a metadata-driven uh, data warehouse automation development environment, then we have the automation of the standards. We have the automation of generation of documentation and the maintenance of that documentation as we go. We have change management, which is done on the fly when we need to do it. And at the heart of it, as I've said in the previous slide, and I just want to reiterate because it is so important, it is a metadata-driven environment. And that metadata-driven environment combined with the data warehouse automation, the generation of code built on top of the data vault model leads us to the ability to do our the data vault methodology in a practical, realistic way. So let me wrap up with uh, a couple of conclusions. The first point I've talked about is, if we're talking about breaking into a data vault, getting that project going, we really need to align business and IT expectations. That means ensuring that we have a tooling that supports both business and IT. The second point, locking in a data vault, is to make sure that our data warehouse developers behave themselves. Well, that's possibly a little bit strong. We want them to be really efficient and to be really happy in their jobs. And that means automating the development processes with templates and with auto automatically generated uh, documentation and code. And finally, when it comes to living in a data vault, it means keeping the future in mind. And that to talk specifically to automating operations and the maintenance based on this metadata repository at the heart of a data warehouse automation environment. So that's pretty much me for this evening. I'd like to say thank you. I hope you found something useful in what I've told you. And I'd just like to hand back to Armon. Beautiful. Thank you, Barry. I loved how you uh, loved how you broke down the path for pursuing a data vault into those three key pieces on that last slide. I want to piggyback off the bell you've been ringing about automation and how important it is for teams who want to succeed with data vault to automate as many of the development processes as possible, as well as to automate the operations and the maintenance by leveraging metadata. Wearscape could not be more delighted to share our newest offering and product in the data vault space, Data Vault Express by Wearscape. Data Vault Express is our new product that was released at the Worldwide Data Vault Conference with Dan Lindstedt this past May. Data Vault Express essentially automates and generates the best practices of Data Vault in combination with our very mature automation technology for the construction, maintenance, and extension of a Data Vault. That includes wizards, patterns, and best practices for automating hubs, links, and satellites. Wearscape's Data Vault Express is a tool IT would use to build, deploy, and operate the data warehouse, of which we don't care if that's Data Vault, Marts, or Third Normal Form, a combination for all of the above, but for the sake of this broadcast, our emphasis is on Data Vault, of course. Data Vault Express is metadata driven. The tool generates code, manages tables, manages indexing, and all the bits and pieces for building and maintaining a Data Vault. So anyways, does this stuff actually work? Our customers, Micron and Vodafone, say absolutely. Micron is loading terabytes of data a day, and Vodafone is like a global horizon. If you haven't heard of them, they're not short on data either. And as a result of them using Data Vault Express, uh, you, know, you can see case studies online on our website with Micron. Uh, they were essentially able to deliver prototypes to the consumers of data in less than an hour, on the fly. 
as well, as well as build an enterprise data vault in less than three months. This is something that, that they legitimately thought would take them years without Data Vault Express. That was in their plan, in their roadmap. Uh, Vodafone, on the other hand, was able to build what would normally take them six months in two days. They also were able to reduce their load time for data by 90%, just a massive difference in time to value. <clears throat> you can see here on my next slide a bunch of logos of organizations that are current Wearscape users worldwide. But I want to stop and acknowledge, uh, you know, some of you might be thinking, well, what if I'm not a huge company like Micron or Vodafone? I assure you, that's totally fine. Wearscape scales up to the household names like the Costco's and McDonald's of the world, but also scales down to the small universities and colleges like Bucknell and Bates. Uh, if you're pressed for time, pressed for people, pressed on resources, Wearscape will fit. That's what it's made for. Wearscape is all about empowering organizations worldwide to deliver business value from their decision support infrastructure, saving time, money, and reducing risk. Wearscape automates the otherwise painful manual process of data processing, building, deploying, and eventually operating a data warehouse or data vault. This frees up resources to focus on the hard and important stuff. And, and at, at this time, this has never been more important. Now that we have more sources and higher expectations from the business. <clears throat> so like Barry said, it's important to acknowledge data vaults are prime time for, for automation. Talk to Dan Lindstedt and he will tell you the best way to go about building one is through automation. Talk to someone who's actually built one or tried to build one. You'll hear, you'll hear horror stories if they didn't get the chance to use automation for it. They'll tell you the exact same thing. Wearscape's Data Vault Express is an integrated platform, automates the design, creation, and operation of conformant enterprise data vaults by dramatically shortening the time and effort needed to design and build a foundational data vault. Wearscape enables project teams to deliver analytics solutions to the business far more rapidly at a much lower cost and with significantly more success than do-it-yourself approaches. <clears throat> that being said, I know that many of you must have some questions at this time, so you can go ahead and ask those now. All you have to do is press the question tab and then type in the question into the dialog box below and press send. Uh, we also had Douglas Barrett joining us. He's one of Wearscape's lead solutions architect. He's here to answer any questions you might have uh, about the, the more technical nitty gritty aspects of Wearscape as well. <clears throat> so let's see here. We got a few already. Uh, the first one here is for you, Barry. It says, uh, it says in challenge three, you say that data vault technology is novel. Don't, do, don't you really mean complex? What can be done about that? Uh, how, how very perceptive of you. Yeah, novel does often mean com complex in our, um, in our data warehouse world. You know, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that when you look at the data vault itself, essentially we have a structure which is novel in the sense that it is different from anything that we've done in the past in normal normal old-fashioned let's call them data warehouses we've got some very specific table types very specific update patterns very specific ways of doing the work and that adds to a level of complexity that um, we probably have not had to deal with before but nonetheless data warehouses themselves have been renowned for the com for their complexity in fact you know I've been involved in data warehouse projects for many years and um, I've been always, you know, I'm not a deep technical person, I know enough to be dangerous, but I've been always very impressed by the skills and the amount of work that the IT folks, the developers put into uh, making a data warehouse work. So I think what can be done about all of this is that we can really start to look to tools like Wearscape's uh, Data Vault Express to really enable um, the developers to have an easier life. You know, if you've developed one of these things once, great, and you can you will do it better the second and the third time. But actually, uh, the Data Vault Express product is built on the experience of many, many different implementations, built on the experience of um, automation over the years, and I think that's where the complexity can be addressed. Beautiful.
Great. Well said. Another one for you. Uh, ongoing operations and rapid change seem to be the biggest challenges. How far can automation really help, Barry? I think, you know, I've been preaching automation since the since the very earliest days and it, it comes in I think in in two flavors uh, the first flavor is in the automation of the coding itself and I think that's um that's something we've already talked about um, at some length um, the the automation of the coding allows us to create if you like the underlying uh, feedback mechanisms, the uh, processes, the operationing, operational processes that we need in order to get uh, focus on uh, all of those aspects of dependencies, failure processing, scheduling, logging, and so on. So the, when we've created all of that code via template up front, that really helps us in terms of the ongoing operations and the and the change uh, and the ongoing change. The other part of it, as I've mentioned before, is is the metadata. The metadata is key here, and metadata is a topic that has has really challenged data warehouse builders since uh, time immemorial. Um, it requires a very different way of thinking about the world. It requires, if you like meta thinking and that's possibly why it's called metadata personally these days i prefer to call it context setting information or csi if you want to use a, an acronym and context setting information i think is really useful and important when we're looking at ongoing operations and rapid change we need to be able to know why we did something the way we did it first or what we've changed in version two now that we're moving on to version six. What is the, if you like, the context of everything that has been done and everything that has happened? And in those areas, I think metadata or context setting information is absolutely vital to everything we do. Fabulous. Doug, hopefully you're unmuted at this point. Got a question for you coming from Howard. Uh, what target databases does Wearscape support? Hello there. Ah, very good question. So yes, you'd have heard that uh, we're using automation, um, automation to generate code, uh, and we push that code down into a target database platforms. So we support the uh, standard on-premise ones such as SQL Server, Oracle, Teradata, uh, DB2, but also uh, cloud databases like um, Snowflake, like Redshift, like Azure, Azure SQL, Azure DW. And then also some big data platforms, so we can push that down into a, into a Hive environment. Uh, so yeah, uh, and that's it. Uh, we're in increasing the number of platforms we support just with re releases of templates. So we're starting to release support, for example, for, for SAP HANA as a target platform, for Postgres, for other database platforms, because they're it's templated code, we can release those templates that are, at, um, a cadence of, of delivery that um, that allows us to support the new platforms as they're requested by our customers. Awesome. And a, another question coming from Paul: Does it does does Wearscape Datablock Express provide a, a quality mark or error mark processing interface? That is a common technique. There's uh, there's nothing built into the tool that's going to say right create for me a an error mark, but that is. Um, very common technique. So if I'm building a data warehouse, I'm going to load the raw data in, maybe as a data vault, maybe as a data store, um, and then we're going to identify data that doesn't meet uh, a quality standard and push that to a, a, an area of the data warehouse. We can call it an error mart that the data stewards can can uh, query. And the ideal for that is to fix source. But yes, uh, an error mart is a very common technique. Um, when we're using the tool to build a data warehouse. Fabulous. <clears throat> Another question coming from uh, Samir. This question says, uh, what, what can Data Vault do with unstructured data, such as video and, and documents? Yeah, well, um, Data Vault has been built. Um, uh, the, the design patterns are for relational tables. Um, 
it, it applies itself very nicely to a big data platform. Uh, the Data Vault 2 is all about parallel processing and, uh, and of course, leveraging a platform that supports that, like a big data environment. But it's still going to need to store that payload in tables. Uh, it doesn't yet extend into completely unstructured data. So it's a semi-structured data where we can, obviously, we've got metadata about the images or about the sound files that can go into the data vault and I don't see why the, the image or the, um, uh, or the video file can be referenced or loaded into, um, uh, into a satellite table. It'd be an interesting test. I haven't actually done that, but uh, yeah, it's not ideally suited to, to completely unstructured data. It's not going to work, but if there's structure there, then hey, it's a nice way of organizing that structure. Gotcha. Uh, another question here uh, coming from Michael, and this may be for either of you. Uh, he's saying that he's found the data vault table relationships too complex for users to understand, and uh, it's caused a lack of acceptance. Is there any solution for that? Yeah, very, very much. The, the, um, the data vault is, uh, is a technical layer in the data warehouse. Uh, we can simplify that with a business vault or an information mart or a data mart built over the top of the, the data vault. By and large, it's not intended to be exposed to end users. It is too complex. It's there to, to manage the, the data. Uh, it's not there really to, it's not applied any simplification or you know, sort of business rules to that data. Um, you know, we need to move that data out and, and publish to a data mart probably to make it uh, much easier to consume by the end users. Yeah, let me just let me just add a little to that. Um, I mean, I think one of the reasons I showed this uh, very early data warehouse architecture is that I really did want to emphasize the idea that that layer in the middle, whether you call it a, a, a data vault or an enterprise data warehouse layer, is there really for um, getting your data cl you know, clean, correct, properly reconciled and so on and so forth. So yeah, the, the, the table structures even in old data warehouses were generally not particularly well suited for end users and it was one of the reasons why we started to build data marts. Um, these days I think there's an additional level of complexity to be dealt with where you have the, um, you know, the data scientists who want to do analytics and those those people may well need to look into your your data vault level but I would expect that they're going to need to be um, more skilled in terms of understanding the data models but again we could envisage putting views over those over those tables to help simplify it somewhat right looks like we got time for just uh, one more question <clears throat> it says here uh, how, how do you keep data together if relationships are based on business keys, which which can change? That's that. Uh, that's well. That's that's a very good question. I mean, they do the relationships. Um, the the link tables represent relationships. Uh, the business keys go into the hub tables. If the if the business keys are changing, that's going to be tricky to to manage unless there's some sort of um, sort of self-referencing, you know, this business key has changed to that business key, in which case you can cope with that. But you need that relationship or, or link table between the old and the new in order to be able to cope with changing business keys. Gotcha. Great. Okay. Uh, it looks like, uh, you know, if, if you guys didn't get a question answered, don't worry. We'll be reaching out to you uh, offline uh, to answer any that, that, le that went unanswered. Uh, we'll also be sending out the recorded webinar uh, sometime this week, as well as Barry's uh, white sheet, Meeting the Six Data Vault Challenges. So be on the lookout for that. We, uh, we certainly thank you all for joining us here, asking questions, uh, being engaged, and hope you really got something out of today's webinar. Um, so be on the lookout. Once again, thank you so much. Thanks, folks. Take care now.